Today's video is sponsored by DraftKings. Throughout his life, Lawrence Phillips committed some unthinkable acts. Everything from felony assault to false imprisonment to murder. He was one of the most gifted running backs of his time. But over and over we find that oftentimes the most gifted people are also the most cursed. As Lawrence Phillips went through his life, there were people who tried to help him. Even some who eventually grew to love him. But there's an old quote that goes, a house must be built on solid foundations if it is to last. The same principle applies to man. Otherwise, he too will sink back into the soft ground and become swallowed up by the world of illusion. Lawrence's foundation begins with a dad who left him and a mom who seemingly didn't love him. His dad left when Lawrence was just a small child. All while Lawrence was suffering so much abuse from other men that his mom dated that he ran away became a ward of the state and lived in a crappy children's center where the concept of home that you and I know didn't even exist. His dad would show back up in Lawrence's life down the road once he realized his son was setting the college football world on fire. But Lawrence rejected him because he never came looking when a smaller, physically weaker Lawrence actually needed him the most. When his dad left, Lawrence's mom moved him to Inglewood, California. This was when Lawrence was still a small child. There, life was supposed to get better, but instead, for Lawrence at least, things just devolved into more and more chaos. There, he was subject to constant abuse. We're talking physical, mental, and emotional, man. To illustrate the point, I gotta tell you a disturbing, heart-wrenching, just anger-inducing situation that a young Lawrence had to go through check it out so when Lawrence was a kid living in Inglewood one of the guys that Lawrence's mom was dating got mad at something Lawrence had done that day here's what he decided to do he pushed Lawrence down on the ground put his foot on his back and urinated on him so Lawrence wasn't just dealing with neglect or indifference now nah, that's pure evil hatred for a kid, he wanted to demean Lawrence and make him feel like he was nothing. Probably because that's how his weak ass felt about himself. He did this to a kid who wasn't even 10 years old. It was something that Lawrence never got over. Scarred him for life. Where was his dad to protect him then? Why was his mom bringing this evil into their home and then allowing this to go on? Over time, Lawrence realized that nobody was going to come to his aid. The men his mom kept around the house were the worst type of scum as I just illustrated to you. So one day when Lawrence was around fourth to fifth grade, he decided that he would be better off on his own. Ran away from home. No matter how many people would try to help him later in life, that feeling of abandonment and loneliness and his mom choosing these losers over him, this is a theme that would persist throughout the rest of Lawrence Phillips' tragic life. So this is what happened to Lawrence Phillips, a man with so many cracks and holes in his foundation that even later in life when people tried to build on top of it, things were always destined to eventually come tumbling down. But other than that, you already know what time it is, fellas. Chew the way. The big game is this weekend, so DraftKings Sportsbook, an official betting partner of the NFL, is actually jumping things off with a big time offer. So any new customer can get 56 to 1 odds on either team. So either Cincinnati or the other team. Bet just $5 and win $280 worth of free bets if your team wins. All right, one more time. Bet $5 on either team to win the game and DraftKings Sportsbook is gonna give new customers an additional $280 in free bets to use how you want if the team you bet on walks away with that ring. Now, if Sportsbook ain't available in your state this weekend, you still got something to play for because everybody can play for their share of the millions of dollars in prizes with DraftKings Daily Fantasy Football Contest. So download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use promo code FLIMLO and get 56 to 1 odds on Cincinnati or LA to win the big game. So again, use promo code FLIMLO at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official betting partner of the NFL. Man, shout out to DraftKings once again for sponsoring the video. Without further ado, skin it. After leaving home around 10 or 11 years old, Lawrence Phillips was eventually taken by the state. He was thrown into McLaurin's Children's Center, a center that would later be shut down 
after it showed that many of the kids had been abused there and basically treated like caged animals. The way it was described sounded more like a prison slash psych ward than anything else, and many of the kids who were there for extended stays developed long lasting psychological issues that would plague them all the way into adulthood. So Lawrence basically left one terrible toxic environment just to be tossed into another one. I really can't imagine what the world must have looked like through his eyes at that point. Imagine your first 10 years on this earth never seeing the concept of love, never knowing the concept of home, never feeling secure, never being safe. This is for the first 10 to 11 years of his life. That was his foundation. After a year in what was essentially a prison sentence, Lawrence at 11 or 12 years old, finally caught the first break of his life. A social worker named Barbara Thomas took a liking to Lawrence and Barbara's sister ran a nearby group home, one that didn't house 300 kids, a place where they actually cared about and raised the children. There, Lawrence finally had a mother and father figure for the first time in his life. It was actually pretty run down, probably by a lot of our standards. But for Lawrence, it was the first taste of stability and love that he'd ever experienced. And maybe if that would have happened a little bit earlier in his life, things wouldn't go down the very dark path that we're about to get into as this video progresses. The seeds of anger had already been too deeply planted, that would slowly take root and eventually sprout into something unrecognizable. Lawrence's lack of emotional control was something he never got better at. He never learned to control his emotions in a healthy way and over and over in his life that anger would cause him to lose everything that he ever valued. This would one day include his football career and the woman who he seemed destined to live happily ever after with. But before any of that, it would first cost him his first home. So after a vicious fight with another kid at the home, Lawrence had to be transferred to a different home. Fortunately, that home was also owned by that same family. They weren't trying to get rid of Lawrence, they just needed to separate him from the other kid because they was going to constantly be at it. Then they did something I think is extremely smart. They would allow the kids to go into sports. That way they can channel these emotions into something constructive. And you can argue that football is dangerous and it is, but not having a passion or a craft at all is a hell of a lot more dangerous for an angry kid i can promise you football gave lawrence phillips a chance a chance at success hell a chance at having a life and overcoming circumstances that almost nobody makes it out of lawrence quickly took to the football field and after initially running away from home and basically dropping out of school in the fifth grade, the sport helped Lawrence to channel his energy into something productive, helping him to get back on track and back into school. He had a talent with potential to take him far, but if his gift was ever going to bring him peace, he would first have to outrun his demons. As a high school freshman, Lawrence shined on the football field. The past several years had gone pretty well, so of course, that's when Lawrence's mom decided to pop back up in his life and took him away from the best thing that had happened to dude up to that point. But she moves him back to Arkansas where he continues to play ball. Only issue was he needed to maintain a 2.0 GPA in order to play on the team. And remember, we're talking about a kid who basically dropped out of school around fifth grade. So when you start presenting these GPA minimums, you kind of assume that's going to be an issue. But guess what? Despite any of that stuff in his past, when it came time to take standardized tests, Lawrence not only passed but was considered intellectually gifted. Once he locked in, he easily mastered his schoolwork like this kid was destined for great things. But he just had to go through so much BS just based on what he was born into. And I want to keep that foundation metaphor fresh in your mind throughout this video. So Lawrence easily maintained his eligibility. That wasn't the only thing he was making look easy. On the football field, first off, that Uno jersey number one is fire. But dude had speed, quickness, power, a mean streak. Hands out the backfield, he was intelligent enough to understand the game. He was a monster on the field. But little by little, that monster would start to show up off the field as well. But before those scars would begin to show, Lawrence first broke ground on something that maybe should have never been possible given the circumstances. He came out of that insane childhood and actually made it to college. He accepted a scholarship offer to Nebraska. There, he quickly grew into a star. And what happens next actually makes me think of lyrics from a song at the end of Disney's movie Encanto. The lyric goes like this, the stars don't shine, they burned. 
People who knew Lauren spoke of how he could light up a room with his smile and warmth. But that glow and heat that they felt wasn't a man shining. It was actually a man burning, engulfed in the flames of his past. As a freshman, Lawrence rushed for over 500 yards and scored five touchdowns. Good start to a young career. Then the following year, his carries tripled as he became the focal point of the offense. The more he ran it, the higher his yards per carry average went up, which meant that at the end of the day, when they tripled his carries, he also tripled his yardage, rushing for an insane 1,722 yards, making Nebraska one of the best teams in the country. And he capped that dream season off with an undefeated record and a 1994 national championship. So you'd think 1994 would have been one of the best years of his life. And I'm sure it was in many ways, but anytime he perceived that somebody crossed him, it seemed like flashbacks from his past would immediately just put him in survival mode. And this would cause him to go from zero to 100. So the same year he rushed for all those yards, he had two kind of ugly situations. One was a fight with a teammate and another was him grabbing a student around the neck during an altercation of some sort. And that whole strangulation thing will become a trend throughout his life. And it just escalates, man. It gets worse and worse and worse. You're going to see what I'm talking about. Despite being a star on the football field and winning a national championship, Lawrence was still struggling to adjust to life at Nebraska. And this was despite making a few good friends on the team and having a pretty supportive coaching staff, actually. So one time, him and his boys that was on the team was at a barbecue. Lawrence tells him, hey, I'll be right back, go and grab some ribs. Now, they obviously thought he meant ribs from the barbecue that they were at, but this man walks off, walks to his car, and drives straight to California through the night where he visited Miss Barbara Thomas, the social worker who actually got him out of children's prison when he was younger. After that, I'm assuming they probably grabbed some ribs. Going into the 1995 season, Lawrence's junior year at Nebraska, he ended up getting into more trouble for accepting a $100 lunch from a sports agent. If he played today, trust me, he was the man. He'd get a hell of a lot more than an overpriced lunch. But y'all know the NCAA was on that BS for a very long time. So Lawrence kind of fell victim to that. Now, fortunately with this one, the Nebraska coaches were able to, to pretty much mitigate this whole situation. Lawrence reimbursed the money and I'm not sure where he got it from, but they was able to kind of sweep that one under the rug, fortunately, because it's stupid that they was getting in trouble for stuff like that anyway. Now his junior season started with a bang. That year, perhaps the greatest college coach we've ever seen took over the job at Michigan State. Michigan State's first game that season just so happened to be against Nebraska. Now Nick Saban was fresh out of the NFL and he admitted that he hadn't seen a back like Lawrence in a very long time. On top of that, this Nebraska team as a whole was ridiculous. Long before his Alabama dominance, going into this one, Nick was actually on the other side of the mismatch. Lawrence Phillips ended up rushing for 206 yards. He scored four touchdowns and he did it all on 22 carries. Saban would later say that Lawrence was the second best running back he'd ever seen. Behind Eric Dickerson who was ironically drafted by the same team. Anyway, Nebraska cruised to an easy 50-10 beatdown victory, making Nick Saban immediately rethink his decision to come to college football. He had to be thinking how nice it was that he wouldn't have to face running backs like this every week. But after what happens following this game, it turns out that no coach would have to face Lawrence for quite a while. So Lawrence and the team fly back to Nebraska, and this was truly the beginning of the end. This next story I tell you will become an escalating pattern throughout the rest of this video. And I can tell you right now, it does not end well. It all starts when the team plane lands back in Nebraska. Most of the players had already cleared off the plane and Lawrence was still in the back, completely knocked out. He was asleep, exhausted from the game. So his coach decided to invite him over for dinner. Now Lawrence could eat, but he turned it down because he already had plans. Lawrence had a date with his girlfriend, Kate, who was a Nebraska basketball player. Following 200 yards and four touchdowns, Lawrence was on top of the world, a feeling he could not wait to share with his girlfriend. But once the man got back, she actually stood him up. Apparently, she had some other plans. She was hanging out with some friends. Lawrence gets back to campus. He's been stood up, so he goes to sleep. Then he receives a call in the middle of the night or early morning, and he received news that Kate 
was no longer his girl. And not only that, but apparently she'd been spotted inside the apartment of Lawrence's teammate, a backup quarterback named Scott Frost. Now this enraged Lawrence as it would any man, but fellas is what you do with these emotions that will ultimately decide your future. Can you manage those feelings or will they take over and force you to do something? that you can never take back. Now real quick, I want you to imagine a kid who grew up like Lawrence, once again being portrayed and essentially rejected by a woman that he cared about. Only now, Lawrence was no longer a helpless child, at least not from a physical standpoint. So this time he decided to do something about it. And you already know, this is not gonna go well. So he went to his teammate's apartment and knocks on the door. Kate realizes it's Lawrence and goes back upstairs. She doesn't open the door. At that point, Scott goes downstairs, supposedly to confront Lawrence. But what he doesn't know is that while he's walking down the stairs, Lawrence is outside climbing. Yes, climbing up to the third balcony. He gets up there, the balcony door is unlocked. He slides it open and oh my God, he's in the room. Once he's there, he quickly confirms that he has been betrayed. He sees his girl in Scott's bed. It's the middle of the night, you know, it's, he sees what's happening here. So there's a couple versions of the story and in Scott Frost's version, Lawrence throws him up against the wall and then just grabs Kate and drags her out of the apartment. Once he got her outside again, according to Scott, he continued to rough her up. Now, when Lawrence told the story, he said that he went out to Scott Frost first and Scott locked himself in the bathroom. Lawrence then admitted to dragging Kate out of the apartment, which means he confirmed that he drug her down three flights of stairs to start. The whole time he's screaming, you lied to me, you lied to me. My man is hurt, he has no idea how to deal with it. Now it was said that he threw her into the mailbox and dented it, but he said that he actually just punched the mailbox and a couple of eyewitnesses said the same thing, that he beat up several mailboxes. But other eyewitnesses say that they did see him strike her and throw her around and do things that a man should never do to a woman. Now I think we all understand why he reacted this way, but it doesn't excuse the behavior. With that said, through Lawrence's life, through the first 10 to 11 years of it, pretty much everybody he encountered did him dirty. But we all know that when you stand trial in actual court or even the court of public opinion, please understand that the world at large does not care about none of that. Please understand that if it happened to your daughter, you would not care about none of that. So I think it's important to maintain the proper perspective. We're telling the story from Lawrence's standpoint. We're trying to understand him and empathize with him as much as we can. But at the same time, that does not mean that we condone his bad behaviors. Now, I think the situation hit Lawrence so deep, one, because this situation kind of reintroduces one of his many childhood traumas. The one where his mom or a woman he loved chose garbage men over her son when he was young. Now, here he is all these years later, and yet another woman he cares about chooses another guy. And it's not hard to imagine that a guy who came up like he did would have some major issues with self-worth, self-esteem, and just feeling worthy. You know what I'm saying? Feeling like a catch. So when he becomes the man on the team and you cheat on him with a dude that don't even play, Lauren's gotta be thinking, I became the man and still. Like, what do I have to do to be loved? You know what I'm saying? I do think he was a little bit twisted, but I do think that was how he felt. And in a whole lot of ways, you can understand and relate to that emotion. Lawrence was ultimately arrested and sentenced to a year probation and he received mandatory anger management counseling, that didn't work by the way, and a six game suspension from the team. Heisman Trophy season, going up in smoke. Despite that, the few games he did play that year were enough to really impress NFL scouts. Now, despite what people say out their mouth, you can look at how most people think, how they maneuver and the things that they say and tell that they believe that money is this magical paper that makes all your problems disappear. This is despite the big, huge ass pile of evidence that we have, which strongly suggests that this is not true. It's cap, false, BS, etc. In the case of somebody like Lawrence Phillips, money can actually make things worse. Cause if you're deeply unhappy or angry and wanna drown that out, you can now afford the substances to temporarily do so. And nine times out of 10 is something that quickly gets out 
of control. After being drafted sixth overall by the St. Louis Rams in the 1996 NFL Draft, the former foster kid signed a three-year $5.6 million contract. There was major character concerns around dude as you would imagine, but he was so cold he was still a top 10 pick. Teams knew it was a risk, but he was considered the best player in the draft by many, so everybody knew one of them top 10 teams was gonna take a chance on dude. But before even signing his contract, Lawrence was pulled over one night after driving 78 miles per hour in a 65, and his blood alcohol level was twice the legal limit. One little detail that was interesting, and you can read into this about a million different ways, so I'll just let y'all decide how y'all feel about this. But when he was arrested, he took his Nebraska championship ring off and threw it in the dirt. A lot of ways to read into that, but hit me with some theories in the comments. He ended up spending 23 days in jail. What a way to start a career. He made it back in time for the start of the season and rushed for 632 yards and four touchdowns. Only averaged 3.3 a carry, so not bad for a rookie, but not great either. With that said, he was great a couple of times that season, twice rushing for over 100 yards in a game and averaging about 6 yards per carry in each of those collectively. The following season, he only played 10 games, but he ended up having about the same amount of carries and basically produced the same number of yards. So while his production wasn't terrible, it still wasn't great considering the fact that he'd get in trouble pretty frequently, he was the number 6 overall pick and... The Rams even traded Hall of Famer Jerome Bettis to the Steelers after drafting Lawrence. This was early in Bettis' career, a player who would go on to produce so many great seasons and, like I said, would go on to become a Hall of Famer. It was actually a status that Lawrence had the talent to reach with Ray Lewis saying, a guy who was extremely familiar with Jerome Bettis, by the way, that Lawrence Phillips was the best running back that he'd faced. And it's funny because there's a pretty well-known story of how Ravens owner Art Modell actually wanted to draft Lawrence Phillips in 1996. But then Ravens GM Ozzie Newsome stuck to his draft board and took Jonathan Ogden instead. Wasn't a sexy pick, but dude went on to become a Hall of Fame left tackle. And then the Ravens, of course, go on to take Ray Lewis in that exact same draft. So let's just say a lot of people did well that year. But things didn't quite work out for Lawrence or the Rams. The thing with Lawrence is that he was torn apart both mentally and emotionally. And in an attempt to cope with that, he began to tear himself down physically as well. Alcohol had become very prevalent in his life during his college days, but now that he had no curfew and no shortage of money, his drinking became more and more of an issue. And according to coach Dick Vermeil, Lawrence's alcohol abuse got so bad at one point that he collapsed on the field during pregame warm-up for his 10th and final game with the Rams in 1996. They had to cut him after that. Years later, Dick Vermeil said that Lawrence was the best running back he ever coached, which is saying a lot given how long dude did it and how many great running backs he's seen. He also said the decision to cut Lawrence despite giving him multiple chances actually still hunts him till this day. And I honestly think he's genuine when he says this because I don't know a whole lot about Dick Vermeil, but he was always one of those coaches who would get emotional over his players. Like he might not have known how to actually help, but I do believe he genuinely wanted to help, you know what I'm saying, and try. I also believe that Lawrence wanted to help himself, but he just didn't know how. So he did what so many of us do, he self-medicated with alcohol. Apparently, even after cutting Lawrence Phillips, Dick Vermeule hadn't gave up on dude. He picked up the phone and put in a call to his boy Jimmy Johnson, who was coaching the Miami Dolphins. Jimmy and the Dolphins brought Lawrence in to give him another shot, but two games and 44 yards in, Lawrence got released after pleading guilty to hitting a woman in a Florida nightclub. And I will say this man, dude got trouble with women, like do not send him to Miami, you know? Probably not the best place to go, but look, the options was limited. Lawrence had began to stay out at these bars until his latest 4 a.m. in the morning. And sadly, it seems like he was searching for happiness in places that he was never going to find it. His experiences with women from his mom to his college girlfriend had both been extremely awful and traumatic. Now he was a grown man who didn't know how to deal with women at all and he struggled mightily with any perceived rejection. And now that the alcohol had taken hold, 
is, is getting you feel me lawrence's nfl career seemed to be over but he ended up finding work in nfl europe playing for the barcelona dragons traveling all the way across the world actually seemed to have exercised some demons for lawrence out in barcelona he was really starting to grow to become the person that he was meant to be and i don't mean on the football field i mean off of it while he was out there he committed himself to a vegetarian lifestyle gave up alcohol completely and lost a healthy 30 pounds and then proceeded to win NFL Europe League MVP rushing for over a thousand yards and 14 touchdowns. He beasted out. That's when Dick Vermeil looked to come through for him again. So he picks up the phone and he calls his other boy, Bill Walsh. Man, Dick Vermeil had them connections for real. Bill Walsh is out in San Fran and based on Vermeil's recommendation and what my man just did in NFL Europe, Bill Walsh decides, okay, cool. We'll take a shot at, at Lawrence. We'll sign him. Now, in this particular case, a lot like the Miami thing, I think this might have hurt Lawrence more than it helped him. And of course, I can't be sure, but just looking at the situation from way over here, that's just what it looks like, right? Like out there in Barcelona, dude was doing so well. He seemed to be in a good space mentally for the first time in a very long time, if not the first time ever. Like maybe coming back to a place that reminded him of all his past issues, wasn't the best idea. Out in Barcelona, he was a great running back with a college pedigree to back it up. A former NFL first round pick and a Europe League MVP. Over there, he was a person of prestige and he had managed to keep himself away from the alcohol and he was eating a healthy diet, right? He gave up the ribs we was talking about earlier. But the second he came back to the US, every other question was about his past. Just reminding him over and over and over so that he doesn't have the opportunity to not be that person. You feel what I'm saying? I know reporters just feel like they're doing their job, but it's like you forcing him to still be that person and to continue to, to live in that mindset instead of moving forward. You feel me? Announcers would literally refer to him as a terrible person while they was calling the game, but they would say, you know, he was so talented that he got a ton of chances. And listen, it's not like it's not some truth to that. He did a lot of terrible things and he gonna do more in this video. But that's not my point. My point is when you constantly remind a guy of how terrible he is, even if he's trying to step away from it, he almost always slides back into that behavior. It's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Like a parent who tells their kids over and over, you bad, you, you, you know what I'm saying? That kid start to wear that. You know what I'm saying? So you're gonna keep calling me this. I'm gonna just do it anyway. I just think it was better for Lawrence to be somewhere where they could appreciate him for who he was then instead of constantly reminding him of what he once was. And maybe, just maybe, we don't know, but maybe that would have allowed him to continue going in a different direction instead of just being pulled back over here. But he was back in the US and things would start out okay, but then they would go bad extremely quickly. Overnight, Lawrence went from league MVP in NFL Europe to getting two and three carries per game. His highest carry total of the entire season was only nine. Dude didn't even have a 10 carry game all year, but when he got those nine touches, that's all it took for dude to get going. And he ended up busting a 68 yard run versus the Cardinals and finished with a total of 102 yards and a touchdown on only nine runs. Now you would think this was a great game for Lawrence. It was not. So running backs are undervalued because they got to run, catch, and block. And running back blocks are crucial because they got to help protect that franchise quarterback. So in that exact same game, Lawrence Phillips misses a block on Southern University alumni Aeneas Williams when Aeneas Williams comes on a cornerback blitz. So Lawrence misses the block. This happens all the time in pretty much every single NFL game that's played. But this time, it wasn't just any running back. It was Lawrence Phillips. And it wasn't just any quarterback that got hit. It was Steve Young. And it wasn't just any hit. It was the last hit that Hall of Famer, legend, Steve Young would ever take. It ended his career. Now people already had problems with Lawrence Phillips. I mean, all of them negative run-ins with women, all of those arrests, all of that stuff. And now you are gonna get Steve Young hurt? Bro, like, can you imagine if Twitter existed, dog? Bro, after the fact, Lawrence didn't help matters at all because after he missed that block, he pretty much went into the tank mentally. 
he probably felt like a failure and basically self-sabotaged until they kicked him off the team. Cause they didn't kick him off the team like immediately. But after that, he had days where he refused to practice. He was going back and forth with coaches. It was literally like he just wanted to get kicked off the team. Like he was trying to quit. He wanted to get the hell out of there. Once Lawrence was cut from the 49ers, money problems quickly ensued as he settled lawsuits and fines. And he forfeited a $1 million bonus after being cut. Now his problems with women would also continue. So he moved in with a new woman that he met. And of course that quickly devolved into another legal situation where he allegedly assaults yet another woman when she tried to end the relationship. The whole not being able to take rejection thing is not even a theory anymore. Like we're looking at it, man. Lawrence was broken. Like he couldn't function at all or take the slightest bit of rejection. He needed therapy and a lot of it. But Lawrence was said to be a prideful guy and most of these guys are too proud to admit that they need help. But Lawrence actually had an even worse relationship with mental health institutions. Seeing as how he was basically captured and thrown into a non-legit one when he was a kid. For him, probably just walking back into one of those places could have actually taken him even further off the deep end. Dude was in a tough spot and he ultimately made the decision to continue to self-medicate by overconsuming alcohol. By 2001, Lawrence had become accustomed to getting into trouble and then getting another shot. He had become way too comfortable with that cycle and didn't seem to realize that it would come to an end one day, but not before he signed with the CFL and rushed for yet another 1,000 yard season with the Montreal Alouettes. He actually held out for a bigger contract the following year, but shortly after renegotiation, he was released when you guessed it, he attacked yet another woman when he accused her of cheating on him. In this one, he was said to have strangled the lady into unconsciousness. At 30 years old, his football career was now officially over. There weren't any more leagues willing to take a chance on the troubled running back. Following that, Lawrence moved to San Diego, meets a young lady named Amelia, falls in love, dates for a while, things are good, and Lawrence was the type to open car doors like dude would fall head over heels in love. And he was constantly seeking out that feeling, but he had no idea what to do with the emotion. He couldn't control it. And it would always put a woman who he seemed to care about in imminent danger the first time things go slightly left. So again, things with Amelia were good, but at some point, Lawrence gets back on the drink. Over time, the drinking gets worse and worse, and eventually, Amelia wants out of the relationship because it's toxic, the, the drinking is out of control. He took it as rejection, and he assaulted her, bro. Beat her up, choked her to unconsciousness, just like the last lady. So Lawrence was dead broke at this point. Amelia bought him clothes, toothbrush, like she was just there for him, you know? But at this point, he was so broken from all the other BS that he had gone through that when he finally found a woman who actually loved him, he couldn't even love her back the right way, man. And it's so damn sad, bro. That is so sad, man. So after he assaults her, a couple days later, he comes back to the apartment. He's knocking on the door and she's terrified, bro. And at this point, she knows about the other women. So she thinks, yo, he's coming back to finish the job. She hides in the closet. She calls 911. By the time the police get there, Lawrence is gone. They issue a warrant, but he evades arrest, okay? Now later, Amelia, who once again really did love this dude, agreed to meet up with him again after he apologized over the phone. She's thinking, you know what? Maybe we can rekindle what we had before because he's telling her all the right stuff on the phone. She meets up with him at a friend's house and you know, I don't know how things go left, but eventually they end up in the bathroom alone and he does it again. He does it again, man. After that, he leaves, takes her car. He's gone at this point. He drives to LA, plays pickup football with some random kids. After the game, he goes back and looks in his shoe and the money that he, he thought he left in there is gone. So in his mind, one of the kids just stole his money. This dude hops in the car, drives onto the field and runs into one of the kids, hits one of the kids with the car. That's what happens. The kids sustain some pretty bad injuries. And at this point, you know, dude is completely unhinged. He's on one. 
he's tripping he needs to be off the damn street he was eventually arrested and sentenced to 31 years in prison for these crimes and it ain't over yet i know this is a long video but this is a delicate story and there's even more to it so we're almost done but not quite while lawrence was in prison his coaches from nebraska visited him in those moments they saw the kid they knew from back in the day lawrence spent his time in prison reading hundreds of books and writing tons and tons of letters he wrote letters to everyone from amelia to his former coaches and teammates his intellect seemed as sharp as ever still while he was in prison he refused to join a prison gang upsetting the politics of the prison and making himself a target he was well aware of this and would even talk about it in some of the letters talking about the ins and outs of prison politics and why he refused to participate he understood that his refusal to participate in those politics would now make him a target so he refused to have a cellmate because he knew that he wouldn't be able to trust anybody of course in prison you can't just refuse to have a cellmate so he ended up getting thrown in a hole you know solitary confinement but eventually they take him out of the hole and despite his many pleas they give him a cellmate now keep in mind lawrence had refused to join the prison gang and the guy that they now put in his cell was a member of a gang not only that he was serving 82 years to life for murder and he was a new transfer to that prison lawrence believed that he'd been given an initiation test to basically get lawrence out of the way on april 11 2015 lawrence's new cellmate attacks him with a shank lawrence was still lawrence though and the dude who ran up on him ended up losing the bout despite having a weapon this is all according to lawrence he said that he was able to get the best of dude and take him out before he got taken out once again he ended up using strangulation as his method of choice saying that he basically put the guy in a sleeper hole until he passed out or so lawrence thought once the guy hit the floor lawrence is banging on the door screaming for the guards he said he assumed the guy was unconscious and would eventually wake up because his awful awful prior experiences had taught him that you know in this case it played out differently about 40 hours later the guy lawrence attacked died of strangulation again a common theme in all of his assaults and now a theme in his self-defense so the prosecution argued that lawrence was simply paranoid and snapped prematurely taking the guy out simply because he didn't trust the guy and didn't want a cellmate in the first place one lawyer even developed her own theory that lawrence just attacked the guy in his sleep what do you believe is the prison gang storyline 82 years sentence and the new transfer stuff enough to sway you or do you think a history of violence irritation and paranoia eventually worn out in lawrence's subconscious it was ultimately decided that he would stand trial for murder not self-defense and the da made it clear that they would seek the death penalty a few hours after receiving that news lawrence committed one final strangulation when he allegedly hung himself in his own cell ending 40 years of struggle violence and trauma there was a suicide note left in his sock that caused even more controversy so like i've established here throughout this last part of the video lawrence liked to write a bunch of letters and one of the things that always stood out is he's this big strong dude who's serving all these years in prison but he just had like this beautiful penmanship right he wrote in his this great cursive handwriting but this particular letter was actually written in sloppy block letters so everybody that was familiar with lawrence's handwriting who was able to see the letter was like bro that's clearly not his handwriting which obviously would imply that he did not actually commit suicide but that somebody else took him out and then tried to make it look like a suicide but again we have no idea what the actual truth is when it comes to that now lawrence also had his brain tested for cte following his passing but those results have remained private they haven't been released lawrence phillips was a broken man a man who longed for love but had been wired in a way that wouldn't allow him to handle the intense emotion rejection especially from his mom early in his life i believe was the root of his repeated pattern of violence against women specifically anytime he faced rejection of any sort from a woman who he developed feelings for he really needed help but didn't know where to look and eventually he was probably too far gone for anyone to bring him back and it's crazy bro like this could be your cousin your brother your friend like this could happen to anybody you know that they're in there and sometimes 
they show you the real them and you're like there he is and i think we all know these people like every time you talk to them it feel like they about to get things on track but then the second you take your eyes off of them because you got your own life and your own problems and your own issues to deal with they just seem to make the same mistakes follow the same destructive patterns over and over and over and that seems to have been the case with lawrence phillips many nfl greats players and coaches have admitted that Lawrence Phillips was the best running back that they'd ever seen. But even with a gift that granted next level speed and quickness, Lawrence Phillips sadly still couldn't outrun his demons.